Hey, what's up, Blue Collar Business Owner? Welcome back to the Blue Collar Prosperity Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Maskell, where we focus on helping guide you to have a prosperous blue collar business. Today, we have with us Andy Halliburton. Andy is the founder of Canlis Capital, where he helps business owners gain access to capital to grow and scale their business. Whether it's for a real estate transaction, working capital, or acquisition, Andy acts as your coach and advocate to get you where you need to go. He specializes in not only looking at traditional sources of funding, but also alternative lending. So that is Andy Halliburton. Welcome, Andy. Thank you so much for being here. What's going on today? Uh, it's been a, been a great week. Things are starting to roll along pretty well. Um, got several different new projects going on and uh, excited to be here with you today. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. So before we dive into your expertise, give our listeners just a little insight into how Canlis Capital came to be. <laughs> it's an interesting quick story. Um, at After uh, 2018, I had a business in Raleigh, North Carolina and, and sold it. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. What I get, it was going into my third or fourth career. And I'm thinking, hmm, I don't want to go back to work for anybody, for sure. And then I'm thinking about, okay, I've done consulting with big firms. I've run my own business, sold it, successful there. Where can I take those experiences and help people out? One of the things that I always had problems with when I had my business was getting capital to grow. And so often I had to do leverage seller financing, call a few friends. Hey, I need $50,000 for a year and a half. Can you, can you lend it to me? Because even my bank, who knew I was profitable, said, no, we can't help you. So I uh, started thinking about it and I came across an opportunity to actually learn how to start your own uh, capital company or lending organization. And I went through that training and um, my wife thought it was a, a shiny object, but it's turned out to be a great experience because I've been able to help people with brand new startups, you know, help people get out of bad situations and save their business. So we've been doing that for the last four and a half, five years now. Awesome. Well, that is a great story. Great way to, great way to kind of segue into your expertise of, you know, lending, capital, acquisitions, all the things that we can use your expertise to help our listeners out there. So you had mentioned getting out of bad situations. You've seen probably all of them. Um, but what are some of the biggest mistakes from a financial standpoint that you see business owners making that maybe if they listen to you today, they can kind of avoid it before it becomes a bigger problem? I think there's so many people that start businesses by themselves and never reach out for help. And you know, specifically when it comes to trying to make themselves bankable and having a good set of books. I think um, when I speak with folks and I say, hey, can you send me this report? Can you send me this report? And right off the bat, I see everything come in on a spreadsheet. That means I know that, you know, there, there's some challenges ahead. Um, I think when we think about being bankable, it's not something you do overnight. It's it's a thought process and it's something that you do need to be thinking about day one before you even start your start your business. So let's let's dive into that further. So what is in your opinion, what does being bankable mean? What can those listeners out there today start doing to be bankable? Because you know, from my experience and your experience, usually when we need the funding, we don't have the ability to get it because we didn't do the things back when we didn't need it. So what are some right. of the things we can start doing today to become bankable? So when we do need access to capital for whatever reason, we can actually get it. Okay. Let's use a really easy example. We need to buy a new truck for the business, right? You know, when, when I'm going to help somebody go get the financing for that truck, the first thing I'm going to look at besides the application, I'm going to look at their bank statements. So many people don't carry a decent balance in their checking account and whatever go comes in goes right into their pocket. Um, and I try to encourage people to have at least, <clears throat> excuse me, three to six months worth of cash on hand all the time for basic expenses. And what that allows me to do is when I go to the bank, I can say, look, look at their average daily balance. There's going to be no problem for them to handle this thousand dollar month truck payment. So I think that's where, especially if a business is heavy in cash, um, they they tend not to, it, it tends not to get to the bank sometimes. It seems like that. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it as well. Obviously, being their CFO of not having the cash on hand, I like to see six months just so we can sleep better at night. And then, like you said at the beginning, you know, don't run your business off a spreadsheet. Use QuickBooks. Have a bookkeeper that knows your industry, knows your trade, so you can 
be bankable when it is time to be bankable. So you said, obviously, the next step. So now we're going to assume we're just going to go down this journey. Now we are bankable. They reach out to you and you said you're going to go to different banks. What makes kind of your offerings a little bit different? Because I'm guessing everybody out there that's listening went to their local bank thinking, hey, I need a line of credit or, hey, we're going to go to acquire this business or, hey, we want to buy some equipment. And the bank's like, no, not interested. Um, what is like, what is your process when you're going to banks and, you know, the other areas of, of actually accessing capital? I think one of the, the first things I can do when I can help somebody is, A, I take it off their plate so they can focus on their, on their company and their, their day, their day job. Because I try to get to know whether it's a regional bank or national bank, I really try to understand their appetites. So rather than the owner of the business going to six, seven different banks and kind of getting deflated because these particular banks aren't interested in whatever the project is, I kind of have an idea of where I can place this before we even get started, but just based on my relationships there. Uh, the second piece of this is a bank's not always the right place to go to a traditional um, brick and mortar bank. We may need to look at a non-traditional lender that focuses on helping small businesses, but they're not they they're not focused on always having fully collateralized loans. You know, because very often the the local bank's going to want to make sure it's 100 percent you know um, capitalized or underwritten that way um, to reduce their risk. So I've got other avenues whether it's unsecured lending, you know, non-bank lenders, things that most people aren't familiar with. And it's not the same things that you see online or get, where you get the phone call, hey, you've been pre-approved for, you know, $100,000, call us. You know, it's not those because those tend to be bad scenarios. Gotcha. That makes sense. And I know, you know, a lot of people that listen to the show, especially in the last three to four years, acquire growth through acquisition, I think has really taken off. Private equities jumped into the blue collar space. They're buying sure. up HVAC, plumbing, electrical, roofing, whatever they can get their hands on. And now a lot of business owners are thinking, man, I'd love to grow through acquisition, but I don't have, you know, a million dollars laying around. What are some of the, what are some of the avenues that we can use as business owners to start acquiring businesses? Well, probably the one that sticks out easily is the SBA. There are programs within the SBA that will allow you to expand and you may not even need to come out of pocket at all. And or I've done acquisitions leveraging that SBA, typically the 7A product, this is the most common, where we actually are getting money back at closing for working capital, just, to, just as this person is trying to expand. Typically where you can do stuff like that is if you're staying within a the same industry or a very similar industry. The other piece of this, especially when you're thinking about, you know, trades organizations, if whoever they're buying out, maybe there's a key person in that organization that has the experience, has the license, that might it might be make it easier, more attractive to the bank to bring that person as a minority owner. Not not necessarily, you know, 25 or 30 percent, it might be 10 percent. But open up the idea to think about, do, is it always just what I'm doing by myself, but think outside the box, understand what programs are out there, and then can I use other people to help me out to get there? Love it. And I do see that a lot where the existing owner does stay on for a license, you know, especially to have that license so you can keep operating, whether no matter what that percentage is, even if they don't have any kind of voting power in the, in the new organization. So when it comes to you mentioned working capital. A lot of times, as you said before, a lot of people don't have a lot of cash in the bank. Um, what are some ways to access working capital? And what do the banks look for? Do they look for a plan to like, hey, what are you going to do with this $100,000 we're going to give you in working capital? Like, is it actually going to make <laughs> your business helps. healthier? Or is it going to go, is it all going to go back to zero just like you are right now? So what are the things that banks are looking for when you know, say someone's listening, like, man, I only got 10 grand in the bank, but Paul and Andy said I need six months worth. I could really use some working <laughs> capital. What are the things banks are looking in order to even, you know, kind of entertain that idea of give, you know, giving out that working capital? <laughs> well, I kind of kind of reminds me when I asked my dad for money because what's it for? <laughs> you know, um, when you when you go to the bank or go to a lender, you need to have a, a well thought out plan. 
okay, hey, I need a hundred thousand dollars, and you need to, so you need to be able to have the storyline of saying, what are we going to do with this hundred thousand dollars, and how much is that hundred thousand dollars going to help me generate in the next two years? Because it, it, it's it's okay, you know, it's one thing to say, hey, I need a hundred grand just in working capital. But, you know, if you don't have a plan to leverage those dollars and actually make your business grow, the bank's not going to be interested in that. They want to understand there's going to be a return on the investment, not only for them, but for you so you can make your payments back and secure the loan. Now, there's there's the idea of loan versus line of credit, which is two separate things. The lines of credit um, are a little bit more difficult to get these days compared to where they were five years ago. Gotcha. So I think that's a good segue into current market conditions. So it's August 2024, we're recording this. What are you seeing in the markets as far as access to capital, interest rates? Obviously, when we're going, you know, if we're going to acquire a business, it was a lot easier when it when the rates were a lot lower because of, you know, the deck, how are we going to cover the debt plus pay the plus pay all the bills and all that kind of stuff? What are you seeing in the markets as far as you know, access to capital, interest rates, trending. Where, where, where is this thing going? Well, that's a million dollar question, right? Um, well, we've seen interest rates, I guess, over the last two or three years uh, go up what, about eleven times, I think, in the last couple of years. And I've watched people, um, you know, get kind of set off on the sideline. And what I try to encourage people to do is we understand that wherever the rate is, the rate is. If this project, let's look, talk about an acquisition. If this acquisition makes sense at current interest rates, which are high today, it's you're going to make even better sense when the interest rates kind of trail back off. And I'm hoping that we'll see, like I think today they, they mentioned that mortgage rates have gone down a little bit. I think we're going to see that when we take a look at, say, like an SBA loan where they work off prime typically. I think we're going to start to see those things trickle down a little bit. But it's not going to be anywhere like it was three or four years ago. I, I think it, we're past the days of it being back in, you know, the fours and fives. Um, but I, in my mind, if the project makes sense, no matter what the interest rate is, to do the project. Because if it makes sense at a high interest rate, it's going to make more sense at a lower interest rate. That makes sense. And you said something earlier that I want to kind of go back to. You said, you know, the story that you're telling to the decision maker. Obviously, with a small business, there might, you know, the, the banker might have a little bit more leverage than versus something like real estate. Real estate's a hard asset. Their underwriter looks at it. it. It's either yes or no, whether it fits in there. Whereas giving funding to a small business, there is some sort of story to that. What what have you seen? Like, how much how much leverage does someone like you or the banker have in kind of swaying that underwriter into, hey, this is a good deal? Well, that's actually one of the things that I think I do very well um, is when I talk with a with a prospective client, a small business guy, it could be you know five hundred thousand dollar business or ten million dollar business it doesn't really make any difference. I try to truly understand their business, understand where their pain points are, where their plans are, and I build relationships with my banking contacts to where I can have very very candid conversations with them. And then we are in lockstep working together to talk to underwriting. And what that allows us to do is support one another and um, work with underwriting to tell that story. And if he and I both are saying the same things, by the time we introduce the client for their client call, the guy or that guy already believes in the project. Now we're just checking boxes. So I think that's probably what I, what I bring to the table to be able to, in, internalize whatever these guys are wanting to do is people get nervous when they go to the bank because they've never, it's like going to the principal's office. You know, they're not used to talking about this stuff where to me, I get excited about it and I can say, Hey, Jim is just hitting it out of the park. If we do this, if he does this, this, and this, he's going to skyrocket over the next two years. Love it. So kind of bringing it back to action items for our listener, as we start to, wrap up this informative conversation. We talked about being bankable. We talked about, you know, acquisition, we talked about working capital and talked about all the issues you see that businesses have that they don't really know they have until they need that money. So what is one thing 
that they can do, I would say, you know, we like to take immediate action. We want to give them something to, to take after the show and actually go do. What is one thing they can do within the next 24 hours to move their business forward? Because obviously we want more money in the bank, but that, that takes a little bit of time. If we want 36 months of money in the bank, we're, we're going to get there, but it's not going to happen in 24 hours. What's one thing they can do tomorrow or today to start becoming more bankable? a good question. I think probably if they take it to take 24 hours and really write down their, their plan for the next 18 months and then make sure that the books of the business get in in good shape, quick, quick books or whatever, but make that commitment to where everything is very, very organized. It, it's not an overnight thing, but I think if they make that commitment to say, hey, I am going to move off my spreadsheet and I'm going to QuickBooks or I'm going to contact Joe Blow bookkeeper, I'm going to take that step. That's going to be the first step to help them get become bankable. Love it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I totally agree. First, you got to have that vision. What, what are we going in the next six, 12, 18 months? What does success look like? I mean, even when I'm working with clients, that's the first thing we do. Where are we going? Because if we don't know where we're going, we don't know what we need to do tomorrow. So right. if, if y'all can get clear on where you want to go, then you can figure out what do we need to do in order to get there? Because I promise you every single person listening is at some point will need access to capital, whether it's a great opportunity to buy real estate, a great opportunity to buy a business or a great opportunity to have an access to a line of credit because you need it to scale. Whatever it is, if you guys can start, you know, building that vision now, you'll be glad you did. Andy Halliburton, thank you so much again for coming to the show, sharing your journey and providing actionable advice for all the blue collar business owners out there as we continue our journey to prosperity. But before we sign off, Andy, where can our listeners go to keep in touch with you and, you know, learn more about what you offer? Uh, my website is www.canlascapital.com. You can launch a, a, an email there or request a time to speak. Uh, my email address is, of course, andy at canlesscapital.com. Feel free to drop me an email. And I'll be sure to get back with you. Awesome. And I can attest, Andy replies probably quicker than anybody. So canlesscapital.com or andy at canlesscapital.com. Andy, thanks again for coming on the show today. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Have a great day. And before you head out, if you are ready to have a business that produces consistent positive cash flow so that you can have a financially healthy business and achieve your personal goals, let's make it happen. Head on over to the bluecollaradvisors.com slash call to book a free financial assessment of your business. I will dive in to the financials of your business. Take a look at what's going on find any red flags as well as opportunities that you have in your business. Let's make it happen. Again, the bluecollaradvisors.com slash call. Until next time, remember what got you here won't get you there. If you're ready for different results, it's time to start doing things differently.